first of all uh, thank you uh, first of all uh, thank you everyone for joining the session and uh, welcoming you all to another edition of uh, satwa webinar series for non profits uh, so this financial year uh, we are kick starting our capacity building series uh, with our fundraising 101 sessions as part of the sessions uh, we have planned uh, a varied of different topics right uh, right from the one today on fundraising strategy to donor communication uh, proposal writing marketing and communication retail fundraising and others so once we find up wind up this uh, fundraising 101 we'll also have sessions on uh, other topics including technology compliance leadership talent and others uh, so we would really love to hear from you all on what are some of the topics that we should uh, hold sessions on so please write to partner network at satwa.co.in uh, with any views you have on how we could make the sessions and series better and on any topics uh, uh, that we can actually conduct uh, sessions on so uh, we'll really look forward to hear from you all um coming to today's session so today's session is on uh, fundraising fundamentals strategy and implementation and today's session will be anchored by uh, shri ram so welcoming shri ram to uh, this particular session um so to briefly introduce shri ram he is the director of fundraising at the nudge institute uh, action uh, development action institute focused on building resilient livelihood towards poverty elevation Uh, prior to Nudge, Shri Ram spent a decade in healthcare consulting uh, before moving to Amnesty International in 2012. Uh, in, at Amnesty, uh, he led the community mobilization and retail fundraising operations for four years. Uh, Shri Ram is a fundraising mentor at ILSS and holds a bachelor degree from Bitspilani. So, welcome, Shri Ram, and thank you so much for agreeing to anchor today's session. We really look forward to today's session. uh so before passing it on to shri ram uh, just i will give a quick overview and brief of how today's session will run and few of the housekeeping rules there right uh, so as you know fundraising is quite a broad topic right so we were really struggling to figure out what are some of the topics we should cover in today's session uh, we could actually go on for weeks really trying to cover the entire uh, fundraising aspect so the way we thought uh, we will run today's session so that it kind of uh, benefits most of you uh, in the session today um, is based on a participant driven approach so what i mean by that is uh, today the session will be primarily run based on the question and answer questions that you come up with so we have uh, shortlisted three key topics based on the questions that have come through the registration form so you can see uh, the three three topics include building a fundraising plan and investing in a donor acquisition and donor retention so we will spend uh, around 30 minutes uh, on each of these topics uh, so shri ram will take 10 to 15 minutes giving overview of each of these topics Uh, covering the main topics or main sub topics under each of these but we want to spend enough time to let you all ask questions right which is relevant to you uh, so that shri ram gets to address those questions and answer any queries you all have right so that's the way uh, that's the way we are going to run today's session and finally at the end we have also allotted uh, uh, 15 minutes so that you can also ask questions that are beyond these topics right and like i mentioned the the reason why we thought a q and a format will be a uh, beneficial is because of the one the, the varied audience we have and what we realize is your requirements are different and fundraising is a very very broad topic what we'll also do post the session is consolidate and curate all these questions together into a document and also circulate among all of you so that it becomes like a go to document if you have any fundraising questions any time um, going ahead yeah um few housekeeping rules so um uh, like i said there will be allotted time under each of the topics where you can raise your questions with shri ram uh, request you to either raise your hand or put your questions on the chat uh, we will take it up and facilitate the conversation from there please feel free to switch on your video and in between if there are any issues any challenges again please feel free to put it out on the chat we will try to address it um uh, as much as possible yeah so thank you so much everyone and over to shri ram uh, to take this uh, forward
Shriram, you're on mute. You're unable to. Okay, let me just check. Can you try now, Shriram? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Minu, and thanks, uh, everyone from Satwa. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear any of what you were perhaps saying in the last five minutes. I had a, I had a, I had my bar interrupted at my place. So I just logged back into Zoom, perhaps, you know, at the right time. Yes, Sri Ram, nothing much. So I was just telling them about how the session will run today and introducing to the three key topics that they will cover. That's all, Sri Ram. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Minu. Uh, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here as part of, uh, you know, Sarkos 101 series on fundraising. Uh, <clears throat> since Minu has already done the introduction, I'll straight away sort of jump in. The objective of this, uh, of the next two hours, uh, you know, is to make it as interactive, as meaningful and as productive as it is for all of you in the audience. So uh, while we have uh, certain sessions planned and time earmarked for it, please do submit your questions in the chat box. And we also have inbuilt Q&A sessions within each session, so as to give ample time for question and answers uh, to be sort of covered. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, before we get into, uh, and thank you everyone for also filling in the feedback uh, that Sattva must have circulated to you, uh, which sort of gives a good idea of what the expectations are, what the needs of the organizations are, what your fundraising plans are for the next sort of one or two years, uh, allowed me to sort of set some context and frame before we jump into the discussions. So. Now, as a fundraiser, uh, we do have uh, a whole variety of organizations today. Uh, some that are, you know, many years old, some that are few years old, and some that are very, very young. So not all of what I say might be equally applicable to all the organizations that are present here, uh, but we'll do our best. So before we start getting into uh, planning for fundraising, uh, I think the first 30 minutes of what I wanted to spend on is on building a robust fundraising plan and investing in it. And what I mean by investing in it is, is sort of committing to it. Uh, all of us want to raise money. All of us have big ambitions, big priorities uh, for our organizations. Uh, but it's important to sort of plan backwards and forward towards raising those funds. And also sort of when we say investing in, in it, committing to it committing to it both mentally and also in very real terms. And what those real terms, in my opinion, means is investing in the talent that will raise money for the organization. Uh, investment in terms of financial investments, or that is capital invested in fundraising. Uh, the third one I will elaborate on, which is marketing. And some of us might choose to call it you know, fundraising communication, uh, outreach, and so on and so forth. Essentially, the bottom line being, the more we are able to talk about the impact of our organization, the less we will have to uh, sell the organization. So how do you invite donors to come forward and support you, then you having to push yourself out uh, in terms of reaching out to as many donors as possible. So pull versus push is essentially what we're talking about. And we'll reserve the final few minutes for some Q&A, particularly on this section. Uh, one of the most important questions, particularly in the last couple of years, uh, I've had the uh, opportunity and the privilege to talk to many, many nonprofits uh, across India. And uh, talent becomes one of the most important critical upstream challenges, uh, which is where everything starts, right, before when we start raising money. And finding the right talent with the right skill sets and with the right mindset in order to raise money from a variety of channels. And from a variety of channels, uh, I do mean whether you want to raise, found, raise money from foundations, it requires a certain kind of DNA, skill set, and a mental model. Raising money from corporates uh, through the CSR, that requires a certain skin, muscle, and a DNA. And raising money from high net worth individuals as a third channel also requires a slightly different nuanced uh, mindset and skill set. So let me start with the most upstream engine of talent. And this means recruiting the right talent, uh, being able to manage that kind of talent once they enter into the organization. So how do we look at performance management? 
how do we look at uh, you know, retention of good talent? Uh, how do we set targets? How do we you know, performance manage targets, um, etc.? And how do we also take goals that are always accompanied with a little bit of stretch, uh, but also realistic and rooted in reality, so as to do justice to both the organization and the talent which is raising money. Uh, so, and this realization, the importance of investing upfront in talent and committing to it is supremely important. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough you know, on that point. Uh, having said that, all of us know that the fundraising talent uh, in, country is not, in the country is not something that we consciously grow. Uh, most people, as I would like to call it, are accidental fundraisers and not fundraisers who are trained to fundraise. And this includes your story. Right. Uh, for example, none of the people in the fundraising team at the Nudge have done fundraising before in their lives, before they joined the Nudge. So fundraising talent in the sector is not a very popular or it's not a, it's not a commodity, it's not a talent that is available in abundance. So most of them, uh, including us, have trained ourselves to be fundraisers rather than coming in with a, sort of the talent and the skills that are required for fundraising. I think if you have to break it down talent into three different parts, uh, at least the way that we think about it is not just one. First one is the sort of what we call is the attitude. Uh, right? And the attitude we surely mean is the person coming in with the right mindset to raise money, to raise funds from all the different kinds of channels that I earlier referred to, be it foundations, be it corporates or high income institutions. Uh, secondly, is the person truly purpose aligned? If the fundraising person does not believe in what the organization is trying to solve, Um, hello, Shreera. I think probably there is an issue with this connection. Uh, we'll just wait for him to get back. Hi everyone, I'm so sorry, uh, it's raining in Bangalore and again I lost power at my place. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So we were, we were just talking about uh, uh, talent. So uh, talent without a very strong purpose alignment and a willingness to deeply understand the programs that you're working on about the sector is extremely important. 
And uh, in my experience, I have found that almost non-negotiable. So the ability to fundraise, the ability to deliver on fundraising targets is critical. It's important, but it certainly does not come at the cost of the person's alignment to uh, you know, the sector, uh, the willingness to the sector, the commitment to the sector, and also the alignment to the program and the mission that the organization is trying to you know, deliver on. Uh, secondly, the smarts. And to condense everything that I've understood about talent, fundraising talent, I think when we look at basic smarts, uh, right, the <clears throat> ability of the person to be extremely resilient and relentless is something that is uh, is something that I wouldn't advise compromising on. So resilience and relentlessness in terms of pursuing uh, and keeping at it is extremely important. Secondly, uh, it's very easy to get consumed in large quantities of data research and information that is the limited information that is available to all of our disposal. I think a very, very strong bias towards action and getting things done in a very real way uh, and not being bottled by uh, the need to do a lot of research about prospective donors or existing donors is something that again is extremely important. The third uh, is the ability of the person to uh, have a certain presence uh, when they have conversations with prospective donors or even current donors, uh, which in other ways could be uh, attributed to building very strong, deep, committed relationships. Uh, and these relationships typically are centered around the work that the organization is doing. And I don't strictly mean only personal or professional relationships uh, that people tend to build. Uh, when, while you're working with uh, you know, donors or donor organizations. So these things become extremely important from a very fundamental smarts of the person that they come in with. Uh, the third one is what I would focus on the skill sets. And when we say skill sets, the primary skill sets, of course, that are non-negotiable are very good on communication. And by communication, uh, I mean brevity is one of the most important attributes the person should be able to carry very deep listening and conscious listening. The idea is to hear more from the donors on what they're looking to contribute to and what they're looking to invest in and being able to uh, put your programs in line with those needs in a very articulate fashion without having to consume a lot of time. So this is excellent communication skills that are verbal. Uh, when we talk about non-verbal skills, uh, skill sets, I would hard skills. I would largely put them under being very comfortable with uh, your basic Microsoft Office tools, uh, which is Word, Excel, PowerPoint. I think a natural comfort with that or an acquired comfort uh, on being able to work with uh, you know, basic MS Office tools is something that would be fairly important when it comes to fundraising talent. Uh, but the most, a lot of these things, uh, again, in my uh, sort of experience, what we have realized as 101 is that do invest consciously in bringing on board people who are very strongly mission aligned, who have a very deep commitment to unlearn their past and are put, willing to put in effort to learn the future or learn about the sector. Uh, resilience and relentlessness in pursuit uh, is extremely important. Uh, the ability to convert conversations into actual, actual money uh, is important. So it is not the number of conversations, but the ability of the person to convert these conversations into, uh, you know, funds for the organization uh, and having coming with and sort of coming with a fairly demonstrated track record uh, of having done this in some capacity or the other. It does not necessarily have to be uh, residing within people who have worked in nonprofits or social purpose organizations. But uh, what, I've, what I've realized is uh, people who have been in result-oriented roles, uh, be it in fundraising or any other uh, role in their past organizations, uh, make very good candidates for fundraising in the social purpose or in our sector. Uh, so that, that's mostly on talent acquisition. In terms of acquiring the right talent, uh, particularly in the last five years, uh, perhaps if I may extend even to the last tech, sort of 10 years, LinkedIn by far has been proven to be the most efficient and effective channel uh, in terms of discovering the right people, 
approaching the right people uh, and also being able to get a good pool of people who are potentially interested in fundraising or after having had a conversation can be uh, convinced to take upon a fundraising mandate within your organization. So LinkedIn has been by far, at least for me, the most uh, efficient and effective one. Uh, and active communication, signaling your need for fundraising talent via your organizational LinkedIn handles uh, and consistent and repeated communication is something that really helps uh, because typically uh, non-profit fundraising teams in non-profits are not a huge team. Uh, they are a fairly small team. So we are not looking at hiring more than, let us say, if I have to assume a ballpark, about eight to 10 people in any fundraising team. That itself is a lot for most organizations. But let's take an average of five people. It's not, it's not a large number of people. Uh, so repeated communication, uh, advertising, particularly on LinkedIn, uh, about fundraising roles really helps draw the right kind of people uh, from the right channels. Uh, so I have, I have personally found LinkedIn to be effective. Uh, beyond LinkedIn, I think many, one is from your own organizational handles. I'm sorry, there was a brief interruption there. Uh, so one is through your own organizational handles on LinkedIn. Secondly, please feel free and please be liberal with your job postings in all your social media handles besides LinkedIn. So whether it's Facebook, whether it is uh, Instagram, I haven't had a lot of success with Instagram recently, but I think those are very nascent stages right now. But uh, I do feel that hosting uh, conversations on Instagram with prospective audience might also give you some leads uh, which can potentially be converted into fundraising talent for your organization. So I would probably rank LinkedIn followed by Facebook uh, second, and then Twitter and Instagram at number three in terms of uh, tools to acquire you know, talent for fundraising. Uh, it's not been an easy process, uh, but uh, out of the success that I have seen from others and also from a personal side, I have felt that investment in these channels really help. And uh, these acquisition channels are not exactly expensive as well. So uh, most of them have just come with posting through the organization and the personal accounts. Uh, very, very uh, tactically smart investments, small investments in LinkedIn campaigns, in sort of recruitment campaigns via LinkedIn as a tool, uh, have also delivered very meaningful results in the short term without having to spend a lot of money. Uh, so that's mostly on the, uh, on the talent acquisition side. Um, on the performance management of the talent itself, uh, sorry, before we get into that, I think one of the most important upstream decisions to be made in fundraising is investment in fundraising itself. A lot of you have asked in your pre-read or questions on how do you look at cost of fundraising? Uh, so people cost as overall cost of fundraising is mostly 80 to 90% of your overall costs. Right? And when I say people cost, I mean the salaries, their cost of travel, uh, their fully uh, loaded cost in terms of their laptops and everything, the fully loaded cost of the person uh, contributes to most of the cost of fundraising in the organization, particularly in B2B fundraising. So if I don't, uh, I'm purely talking about fundraising from institutions and not retail fundraising or individual fundraising. Individual fundraising is something that we can visit a little later. But if you look at institutional fundraising, mostly it is a cost of people and the travel and overheads that contribute to the overall cost of fundraising. Uh, so committing to it and earmarking a percentage of your overall organizational annual operating budget towards investment in fundraising becomes supremely important. Uh, as far as a general guideline um, on the overall cost of fundraising or how much you may want to earmark, typically, uh, a good organization uh, typically tends to operate anywhere between 1.5 to 2% up until 4% of the annual operating budget as the cost of fundraising. So and 5 or 6% also is on the higher side if you want to be extremely aggressive and invest upfront. But anywhere between 2 to 3% of your annual operating budget going into the cost of the fundraising team is uh, it's a pretty good investment uh, and a reasonable investment to be making uh, in order to raise uh, you know, funding. Uh, 
The third aspect that I wanted to focus on is on the on the marketing. Uh, when we say marketing, again, I mean fundraising communications. So <clears throat> there are multiple ways to look at it. If you're an early stage organization, uh, let's say organizations are not-for-profit organizations between one to three years old, uh, it's the one of the things that you really have as your strong selling point is the people who are associated with you as an organization. So whether it is your people as part of your governance, which means people on your board or on the advisory board, your leadership team and your uh, early team members who join your organization uh, become extremely important, critical assets uh, that you should be using in your communication because that signals a lot of credibility uh, authenticity and also performance orientation when you're able to attract good people to come into your organization. Uh, this is typically in early stages when the organization is just sort of, sort of beginning your journey if you're at that stage. Uh, once, let's say, uh, two, three years into your, uh, you know, once the program start to deliver, once there's a little bit of maturity in the organization and the program, it's extremely important to talk about impact and center your conversations around impact. Uh, and all of us are familiar with this, that the attention span of people uh, in the world that we live in uh, have started to you know, diminish or take a downward spiral. Uh, a lot of information is consumed purely on the mobile phone and not on the laptop. Uh, most of the information that's consumed is bite-sized information, which is smaller, impactful pieces of content uh, and not very long drawn presentations and documents that people do not have the time to read and invest in. So again, leveraging a lot on your um, on your social media handles, particularly on LinkedIn. Uh, I wouldn't focus, I wouldn't see the same thing in equal proportion between LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, but focusing a lot more on your organizational communication handles to talk about the impact um, when we say impact, again, there are outputs, there are outcomes, and there is impact. Uh, impact takes a bit of time for the organization to establish evidence on. So most of them are your programmatic uh, stories and impact from the ground that is, uh, uh, that is nicely designed and effectively communicated uh, through your audience consistently. Uh, again, I repeat the word consistent. Uh, a flash in the pan, once in a while, uh, you know, communication doesn't really tilt the scales in anybody's favor, but consistent communication, predictably coming from your organization handles, creates those pulls that are necessary, uh, either via LinkedIn comments or via an email to your organization uh, that is more inbound than you having to be outbound. Uh, one is your social media handles. The second one is your website, in your investment in your website as an asset. Uh, again, uh, the more simpler, uh, straight, uh, minimal words that you're being able to use in order to communicate your central message, uh, that is far more powerful than going into an enormous amount of details about the programs. So, <clears throat> would recommend a strong amount of investment in figuring out what is the kind, what is the right language. Uh, that you can effectively use to articulate your program without having to, in line with how donors and funders would like to typically hear about it. That, however, does not mean for a minute that you're diluting the essence of your work or compromising the articulation about your work. Uh, both are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I think there's a very real fine balance or without having to... Uh, you know, compromise on anything, you can very meaningfully communicate a message, but please do focus on brevity. The more crisper, shorter, tighter, and to the point, and as direct as it is, the more helpful it is to consume information and being able to engage on your website. Uh, so one is a very simple, clean uh, design of your website that's being able to articulate your uh, work clearly. Again, small nudges in the form of uh, your existing donors, uh, what they have to tell about your work, the work itself, uh, many anecdotal examples of impact of your work or any evidence that has already been established by uh, an external independent assessment or even sometimes an internal independent assessments uh, that you may have done from your side. These become extremely impactful to communicate on the website. 
as early as possible. So uh, a visitor to your website does not necessarily have to travel three, four pages inside to discover this information. The more immediately accessible this information is on your website, the more sort of compelling and impactful it is. Uh, the third one is also very, again, small investments in continuous communication, uh, what people refer to generally as drip marketing. So if you have a database of people who you would like to reach out, and when I say database, I mean email IDs of people who you would like to engage, uh, it's very important to communicate with those prospective donors and also your existing donor partners in a manner that it becomes very predictable. So these are simple email newsletters uh, that uh, can be designed, can be automated through several openly available free tools available and some might come at a very small nominal cost. So investment in these areas becomes extremely important to continuously communicate what the organization is doing. Uh, so that's where I would uh, put as talent uh, talent acquisition for fundraising, uh, investment in the right kind of people, which I have found to be extremely important. Uh, and 50% of the battle is won once you have the right people in the organization to raise funds. Uh, a commitment to investment in fundraising in terms of capital. Uh, again, we spoke about an overall ballpark percentage figure as, as a percentage of the annual operating budget. And the more you're able to talk about your organization uh, and communicate consistently, the less you'll have to pitch to prospective donors. So focusing more as much as possible on inbound lead generation rather than uh, you know, outbound communications, particularly if you are an organization that is already in the ecosystem for five to seven years. Early stage organizations uh, will have to do the hard work of actually reaching out to the donors proactively. But I think as you mature, focusing more on inbound leads more than outbound uh, outbound leads, really, really sort of things. Uh, Meenu just want to make sure that we are doing okay on time. Uh, so would love to take a pause here and very happy to answer actual questions if uh, if people have any. Yeah, Ashwin, I'm right on time. So uh, I think it would be a great time to open this up for questions. Um, so uh, we have next 10 minutes when Shriram can take questions on this particular topic. Uh, so request all of you to either put your questions on the chat uh, or uh, to unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, so there's one question, uh, Kirti, I'll just come to you. So Shriram, there's one question um, from Sartak uh, of Harabazar. He's saying that he's building a team from scratch um, uh, and that as you mentioned, the initial team should be small, three to five people what could be the different roles that they kind of perform? Yeah. yeah. So, so Sartak, if it is an initial team, I wouldn't even look at three to five people to begin in the first place. Uh, and that really depends on your affordability and the budgets that you have your, at your disposal. Uh, but when you say initial, I presume that if the organization is anywhere between one to three years old, a fundraising team of not more than two people are required. Uh, right? So, so two people, and but investing in two right people are far more efficient than having five people. So that's one. Uh, in terms of functional skill sets within the fundraising team, for your organization, and I presume you're an early stage organization, uh, these have to be sort of well-rounded and we cannot really slot skill sets. But in skill sets, broadly put, there are three things. One is... Uh, one is what we uh, typically tend to call as pre-sales. And what I mean by that is there are there is a certain kind of skill set that discovers prospective donors, which means doing quick and dirty research on prospective donors, be it a foundation, corporate, or an individual. Um, so putting it together in a simple Excel sheet to track what kind of donors do exist, what their budgets are, what their thematic areas of focuses are, and geographical areas of focus are. These are more than enough. Most importantly, who are the people in the organization uh, at the decision-making level, whether it is the CSR heads with, with respect to corporates and also people in the CSR committee of those corporates who tend to make decisions. This is typically in the case of corporates. With foundations, it's mostly, uh, they don't encourage unsolicited applications, but it is mostly through their website and other uh, networks that you may have within those foundations. So people who are able to do this quick and dirty research, uh, shortlist your prospective organizations, 
and people who can build effective proposals, so which means uh, people who can write grants, uh, people who can build good PowerPoint presentations and write effectively is one kind of skill sets. The core skill set, most important is to front end, all right? So who's going to be the person who is talking to prospective donors and pitching your work? That is pitching is one thing, but also being able to navigate within that organization, uh, the partnership. What that means is you've had the first call. What did you do after that? A series of steps that you do after that is equally important as much as the quality of pitching. So navigating within the donor ecosystem to make sure that your proposal is moving forward until it reaches a point where the MOU is signed and the partnership is closed. That's the second kind of skill set which we typically refer to as hunting, right? which is a person who is front-ending the organization with the donor agency. The first one is more at the back end where things are happening within the organization. The third part of the skill set is where you're managing your existing donor portfolio, which is mostly partner management. All right? So there are programmatic reports, there are financial utilization reports, there are volunteering engagements, there are leadership engagements, there are events that might be happening within your organization where you would like to invite your donors. Uh, there, are, there are partner you know, conversations or summits that might be happening. Uh, so there are plenty of things that happen once a partner is onboarded. Uh, and for a person to manage this uh, portfolio of partners uh, also becomes an important skill set. So in the early years, I would say two people are enough. So one person perhaps focused on acquisition and the other person focused on retention, depending on how many donors do you have, uh, right? Is something that is more than enough to, uh, you know, you know, to sort of have in a fundraising team would be my would be my guidance. However, having said that, it's very important to have at least one of these people who is sufficiently senior, and I would recommend uh, somebody with at least ten years of experience or eight to ten years of experience, because experience does matter and seniority does matter when, especially when it comes to having conversations with uh, prospective donors where the decision makers are typically more than 35 or 40 years old. So seniority does matter. So please do have at least one person who is, who is sort of sufficiently senior. Um, thanks, Sri Ram. So there are a couple of questions that have come up. Um, I'll, I have clubbed a few questions which are similar, Sri Ram. Also, I would let you take a call if this is a topic that you're covering in the donor acquisition piece. Uh, you can choose to kind of address it there. So the first question is also uh, on the importance. So I'm just combining few. One is on the importance of having blog on website. Uh, and also are mailers a good way to update uh, donors and be in communication with donors in a regular manner? And generally, what communication uh, strategy uh, is to be used to display uh, one's work uh, with the donors? So I'll just uh, club these three questions together, Srila. Sure. Uh, so I think one of the, on, on, on communication itself, uh, the website becomes the most important de facto tool to be investing in. So investment in the website uh, to make sure that the information about your programs are continuously updated at a certain predefined frequency. Uh, static information or dynamic information that's one. Blogs are blogs as a tool to communicate uh, is all right, but blogs typically come in extremely handy when you want to position people within your organization as thought leaders in the particular program. Uh, more than uh, a fundraising tool uh, is what uh, I've seen in my experience. So for a fundraising person in your organization or your leadership team in your organization, for them to be represented as thought leaders in the work that they're doing, blogs become a very interesting tool. And once they build a certain personal following or a professional following on their own handles, that could also invite a lot of inbound things uh, from prospective donors. But besides that, uh, website, emailers, and emailers you already spoke about, automated emailers uh, at a predefined frequency. The frequency could be once in a month, or sometimes once in a quarter, depending on who the target audience is. Very senior people in prospective organizations do not want to be receiving emailers once in a month. So perhaps there you would want to uh, reserve it for once in a quarter. But your 
but the uh, you know the contacts that you have in your corporate the csr heads etc i think once in a month communicating about your work in terms of what is happening what is upcoming in your organization uh, again stories of impact stories of people who have joined your team uh, are become these information in a very predictable manner composed in the form of a newsletter which typically can be designed through a simple canva tool uh, becomes more than more than good enough reasons or more becomes becomes sort of important uh, to uh, you know you know to put in practice uh, third very very important thing is to build the fundraising person's equity on linkedin most of the conversations begin on linkedin so the fundraiser or the person who is accountable for fundraising in the organization needs to have a linkedin presence it's almost non negotiable uh, how effectively do you add the right kind of people in your network how often do you reach out to them uh, how frequently how fast is your response time uh, on linkedin when somebody responds to you these become extremely important smaller but important tactical pieces of things to start building a relationship so the more active you are on linkedin the more your name is in the recall of prospective donors that really builds uh, your organizational equity and also your own personal equity as a representative of the organization who is raising money for the work that you you are actually doing thanks thanks shri ram uh, moving on to the next question um, this is primarily on how to generate inbound leads right and how can uh you generate leads through linkedin and would it be too intrusive to ask for calls through um uh, linkedin specifically so uh the question is on one uh how to what is the best strategy to generate leads inbound leads second is how to generate leads through specifically through linkedin sure so you know i will cover this in the in the donor acquisition okay uh, are there any talent related questions in particular that people may have asked or Sure. Please feel free to speak up as well uh, by raising your hands. Would love to answer them first. I will cover this in the donor acquisition. Yeah. So, Shriram, there are certain questions on the tools uh, that can be used for um, uh, getting data, right? Uh, data which will help in uh, acquisition, uh, fundraising, and acquisition of relevant donors. I believe that is also something you'll cover in the donor acquisition part. There is one question on talent. So, this is from Nitika from Sakar. Um, she says that uh, they are a 15 year old organization they yet don't have a fundraising team and would you recommend uh, setting up a separate uh, fundraising team uh, nitika if you would want to add on to this question please feel free to speak up so there is also vidya okay. singh who say has a similar question which is a 15 plus year old organization with no dedicated fundraising team so uh, what would your suggestion be uh well that's that's uh, that's really something if you are uh, if you do not have a fundraising team my question i have a lot of other questions but um i do feel fundraising is uh, a unique skill set that needs to be consciously developed within the organization uh, so a person who is um, multitasking between programmatic roles uh let's say a hr role and a fundraising role is not uh, is not something that is very sustainable in the long term it's unbelievable and kudos to you uh the tikka for having done this for the last 15 years without a, without a dedicated team yeah can uh, i can i just pitch in here before sure. shiram you continue yeah so um you are, you are absolutely right it is a tedious thing but uh, as of now the status is that like we are 15 year old organization and for the past one or two years actually now we started feeling that we really need to have a separate person as a fundraiser maybe one or two people but the issue that we face here is uh, where to get the funds from because you know for to pay the salary for of the fundraiser because as of now actually we are uh, a dual leadership in the organization and we were actually getting funds and managing the organization so how this is how it was going on now the issue is that we started feeling that we really need one or two people at least a person to carry on this work so that we can concentrate somewhere else and we are able to actually because uh, as a lot has changed a lot has changed in the funding scenario and things going on you know so that is where my question comes in from that where do we get this like you uh, thank you but in your presentation you definitely 
gave some insight into where we can get people from but still i had this question so that is why i came up with it thanks satika uh, i think to raise money for investing in the fundraising team uh, i think i've also been casually skimming through the you know chat uh, questions i think unrestricted funding that typically comes from foundations uh, who are extremely comfortable with uh, funds being deployed for organizational capacity building uh, right uh, so before i get into some specifics here is again a general sort of guideline funding from foundations whether they are domestic foundations or international foundations uh, are generally not recommended to be consumed for programmatic purposes so because the value of uh, a single dollar from a foundation is very very valuable uh, may I request uh, people to be on mute i hear some uh, you know honking from the bus or not wherever people might be there thank you uh so any funding from foundations a value of 1 dollar coming from a foundation which is for unrestricted funding is equivalent to raising 10 rupees or 10 dollars uh from a corporate in india which typically is all programmatic funding uh, right so raising money from foundations to recruit your fundraising team or to invest in the fundraising team uh, nitika is the best source of funding uh foundations is one you will also find plenty of high net worth individuals in india particularly from the entrepreneurial ecosystem and i'm talking about first generation second generation entrepreneurs right uh, i'm sure all of us must be reading this news on 100 different unicorns uh, in india uh, that have been given birth to in the last sort of few years uh, so entrepreneurs understand the importance of people uh, understand the importance of raising capital and you will also find uh, generous first generation entrepreneurs who are able to give funding in order to recruit a fundraiser and i myself have had several examples of people who are willing to invest in talent so either foundations or individuals uh, raising money from them to invest in talent for fundraising is a useful source using corporate csr fundraising for uh, investment in fundraising team is something that is practically difficult and also something that i would not recommend um thanks shri ram just in the interest of time i'll take one last question which i think is quite relevant so um, um there is uh, pramod ji asking um the opinion on appointing a fundraiser fundraiser as a consultant on a consultant basis right fundraising for either a particular project or uh, as a consultant and what would your opinion be on that uh rest of the questions are largely related to acquisition and engagement and retention with donors which i think we'll cover later also to let the participants know uh we'd go into the details of uh, pitching communication and so on uh in the later sessions that we are scheduling across the next two months as well yeah over to you shri sure so uh and i think opinions there are no there is no one right answer here on engaging a third party whether it is a company or whether it is an individual in the capacity of a consultant part time or full time i don't think there's really one right answer uh, but if i have to give my personal view point um, i feel fundraising talent should be home grown and should be full time uh, so i'm not a very big believer in part time consultants and part time capacity uh, one it may give you short term quick returns or quick wins but it is certainly not something that is sustainable uh for the medium and the long term so that's my personal take and that's a very strong opinion that i carry thanks shri ram i think we can move on to the next topic uh, of donor acquisition um ashwini can you please move the slides sure uh while i do this i'm also cognizant of some of the questions that are coming on the screen so i'll try to answer as many Uh, as many as possible as i speak for the next 15 20 minutes uh, so donor acquisition uh, i think i'm sure there are there are hundreds of questions here but again in the interest of maximizing the time that we have one of the most important things which is where everything begins from is being able to open doors at the right time at the right place with the right people inside your donor organization uh this is by far the most important step everything else is something that can be uh everything else i feel is science 
and this particular thing is pure is nothing but purely art art right so uh, so i'm going to focus a little bit on this uh, if everybody's okay with that um what do we mean by opening doors <clears throat> opening doors and let me answer it by category foundations typically the importance of this is not so much relevant uh, it's very very important to keep track of foundations most of the international foundations be it bill and melinda gates rockefeller school many of your international funding agencies and foundations all of them have a linkedin presence please do go and follow them on follow their linkedin handles typically most people any public announcement of them soliciting applications is advertised on their linkedin channels so there is no better source to uh, you know discover that piece of information directly from their mouths second thing please do subscribe to their newsletters uh, again by simple registration which will just get those information delivered to your inbox the third one is uh, there are platforms like tamuku which i'm sure most of them in the audience are familiar with uh, these are bite sized again information that is delivered to your whatsapp the annual subscription i think the cost is around 1000 rupees where you can get uh, funding announcements delivered to your whatsapp via tamuku as a platform tamuku basically crowd sources all information across the web and they send it to your uh, you know whatsapp uh, there is also something called foundation directory online uh, which is again you can either take a paid service or you can start with a free service uh, which is again quite valuable in terms of discovering these foundations who are these foundations where are they present what do they fund who are the decision makers etc are something that you could find uh at the end of this session i'm also happy to send um, uh, a geographical map of foundations all over the world it's basically you can just click at the click of a button see it on um, on an online map across different countries which will at least give you a starting list of foundations that you can uh, prospectively go and raise money from so however these are quick and dirty researches research via google research via certain platforms certain products mostly via linkedin etc that you could use however um, this in my opinion is not is not rocket science it's not it's not uh, extremely difficult to figure out but the step after this once i know that here is a foundation how do i get to the right person all uh, right most of the foundations do not accept unsolicited applications so they do solicit applications on request so it's important to build a certain presence of your organization with people inside the foundation most of the people from the foundation are present on linkedin are available on linkedin uh, adding them reaching out to them just to have a conversation not necessarily on fundraising all right reaching out to them to get to have a, a conversation on the sector introducing the opportunity to introduce the organization and the work without coming across as extremely pushy and asking for funds most people respond to requests if the request is solicited in an appropriate way which is not intrusive so a simple small linkedin message saying that hey i work in so so organization uh, i have been following your foundation for quite some time now i understand these are priority areas would love for an opportunity to get myself introduced or get myself acquainted to you and learn about your foundation's priorities is a good enough starting point the relationship once it is built and taken forward after two or three or four conversations uh, then i think it become it can depending on how you are able to navigate those conversations which again is a very important relationship building skill uh, then i think those proposals can be channeled through the appropriate person inside the organization that specifically on the foundation side most of them in foundations again are, are top down so it's very important to get connected either directly or through somebody else uh via linkedin to the to a senior person in the organization without which the the paperwork and the proposals do not move forward so uh, try and get to somebody who is a who is a principal investment uh, uh you know person uh, or uh, you know sort of director focusing on a certain program or a certain area be it gender inclusion be it financial inclusion be it education the person who heads that portfolio part uh, or the people who are part of the portfolio team in the investments portfolio team please do look for such designations within the foundation and reach out to them to build a certain relationship where you can have conversations uh, most of the conversations practically speaking in my opinion begin from an from an approach towards learning about them 
and sharing your work and it does not begin with an intent to ask them directly for money. Uh, so that's one. Uh, with corporates, uh, uh, again, when we see opening doors, uh, <clears throat> In corporates, there is a CSR committee. Every corporate needs to have a CSR committee that is responsible for, that is mandated by law, and that is responsible for making decisions on the organizations that they want to invest in. Uh, then there are CSR teams in the organization, which I'm sure all of you understand and are aware of. <coughs> um, again, reference really work. So please, the first research that needs to be done is how do you get connected to that person and the research about the organization's uh, thematic areas of focus, pouring over their website, pouring over csr.gov.in or uh, CSR box, for example, all the publicly available information about the organization is important. Uh, but the most important thing is to figure out how do you get across to the right person in the organization. So this proportionate amount of investment and focus in figuring out the right way to get connected to that person is perhaps the most important thing. And how do these things, what, what could be some of the ways to do that is, uh, if you have people on your board, and this is where I think the participation of the board and the, uh, the importance of the board comes in very handy. If one or more of your board members are connected to anybody in the organization, not necessarily as part of the CSR committee, uh, is connected to a senior leadership member in the organization, it certainly helps. So them just introducing you on an email to, uh, you know, to the corporate, uh, to a senior person in the corporate, it helps to start the conversation. That is no guarantee of the fact that they will, they will dedicate the funds, but uh, that is an opportunity to open the door top down and to have a conversation with them to uh, you know, introduce your work and introduce your organization. So it could be through the board, it could be from people within your leadership team. Not always everything needs to happen via the fundraising team itself. So the leadership again plays a very important role uh, in connecting the fundraising team to appropriate people in corporates. Uh, when I say corporate, it could be anybody in the, at the CXO level or the CSR head who typically manages the entire CSR portfolio of the organization. So any of these two audiences really helps. Uh, so that's about opening opening doors. And this is probably the most important thing where maximum amount of time should be going uh, with the fundraising team, either to research, saying here is the person, here are multiple ways to get to that person, which is the best way that we can choose. And having conversations, deliberations, justifications, and a clear rationale to choose one or two of these pathways becomes the most important step uh, before we start having a fundraising conversation. So uh, that's on the corporates. Uh, on the high net worth individuals uh, side, there are enough publicly available uh, information about the number of startups in India, uh, startups that are doing really well. I'm not talking about early stage startup organizations. Uh, I'm talking about, let's say, as a proxy example, startups that have received uh, beyond CDC, Series D funding. Right? Any organization that is a Series A, Series B funding is probably not the best time to reach out to them. Uh, they are in the process of raising capital for themselves and are building a business. But startups who have raised Series C, Series D money, uh, all of the founders, all of their members are there on LinkedIn. So uh, reaching out to them um, to, again, uh, have an association, it's important to do some research about the person. So what kind of person are they? Are they the right people to be associated with your organization and your kind of work, uh, right? So it is not any high net worth individual, but an individual whose name will lend credibility, whose name will lend perhaps a little bit of funds, not always funding, credibility also equally matters. So if the person is coming from an area, let's say you're an education nonprofit, and the person comes from an education startup, then obviously there's a certain match and synergy. If the startup is a healthcare startup and you are, uh, uh, let's say, an organization that is working on sexual reproductive health, again, becomes a very nice angle to play uh, with. So approaching them um, very earnestly and very directly. So when I say directly, no long messages, short, crisp, bite-sized, direct uh, message, asking them for an opportunity to get acquainted. 
not necessarily to raise money, but to get acquainted and build familiarity is a good enough step. And uh, that would that's perhaps what, so opening doors, I mean getting in touch with the right person at the right level at the right time. Uh, that is perhaps the most important thing. When I talk about a fundraising calendar, I think, I know some of you also asked this uh, uh, in your questions and perhaps also in the chat boxes. Uh, before the CSR law went into certain amendments, particularly last year in 2021, we typically saw at least among corporates, most of the decisions and disbursements of money are being done in quarter three and quarter four of a financial year. So I'm taking financial year as April to March. So quarter three would mean the beginning of October. So October to March is when most of the decisions and disbursements used to happen. However, having said that, the conversations happen throughout the year, starting from April to March. So there is no bad time to approach a corporate. If not this year, at least it will feed into the pipeline for the next year. So this used to be the case before last year, all right? And, or until last year, October to December is, October to March is when most decisions and disbursements were being made. Today, given the change in the law, where there are uh, expectations around utilization for that financial year, there is enough reason to believe that most uh, of the conversations and decisions might happen in the first and the second quarter itself, because there is a need to uh, spend the money within the same financial year. So the disbursements have to happen early in order for the expenditure to happen earlier. So April to uh, September will become an extremely important time for you to have conversations, submit proposals, make sure that the proposals are reaching the CSR committee, uh, which sits at least on a quarterly basis in every corporate, and that your proposal is among the, among the proposals that are under contention. So that would be, uh, in terms of from, from a good timing standpoint, uh, I think the calendar from the first six months and second six months, the tables have slightly turned, so very important to, I feel, focus in the first six months, particularly in this financial year and going forward. Uh, the third aspect, I will spend a little bit of time and then jump into questions is on the breadth versus depth. Uh, what we really mean by here is, do you necessarily have to work with a large number of partners uh, or do you want to consciously work with small number of partners but really focus on depth? Uh, again, there is no one answer and there is certainly no one right answer. Each of them has its own merits. Right? Uh, I think organically the way the organization has grown um, or the way opportunities knock at your door is something that you may want to build on. So when we talk about breadth of support, I think, do you want to have six corporates supporting you with an average ticket size of 50 lakhs per year? Or would you like to have two corporates supporting you with one and a half crores every year, right? Um, again, there is no one right answer because in, in case A, in type A, where you have six partners, uh, I can argue that you have six different partners. So your risk is mitigated. There is more spread of partners and it also allows an opportunity for you to invest deeply in each of these corporates to build a long-term relationship. So they may start giving you 50 lakhs per year, uh, but then that 50 lakhs has the potential to grow to 5 CR over, over the next few years. Uh, versus the second uh, uh, you know, uh, case where you have two partners, again, there's also merit in that because then your cost of servicing the donor, your cost of partner management reduces because there are only two donors to manage. Uh, but there is also sometimes, uh, an act, even though it is an academic risk, but it is still a risk, that if one partner happens to, for whatever reasons, if they are going through certain changes in the organization, and if they have to uh, sort of pull the support down, then it exposes the organization to a lot of risk uh, from a working capital standpoint. So uh, that, that is also there when you have fewer number of partners, but a, but a lot of depth. So I think the breadth versus depth is not a decision that uh, I would suggest we have to plan, plan upfront based on the kind of donors that you already have, if you do not, if you're just starting out on a fundraising journey, then I think it is more important to be opportunistic uh, rather than focusing too much on the bread versus depth. So get as many partners as possible, reach out as many as possible, and then we can figure out the bread versus depth on how to manage it. Uh, but if you're already a partner with a large number of partners, it's very important to focus on building relationships with them, especially in a climate where 
uh, the funding available is limited, but there are so many organizations. So investing in your existing partners is supremely important if you're already a 10, 15 year old organization versus acquiring new partners year on year. So that's how I would very at a very high level uh, split between the two. Um, thanks, Sri Ram. Uh, currently, we don't have any additional questions, but again, request the participants to uh, drop the questions on the chat or speak up. I'm just going back to the earlier questions, uh, Sri Ram. And there was one question we said, uh, which said that how long should we wait to hear from the donors once the details are shared uh, with them? Uh, would you want to take that up? Well, uh, there is no. <coughs> There is no again fixed time here and uh, one is there is no fixed time so i think once you send typically uh, right and these are very intuitive calls that you take let's say i send the first message on linkedin asking for a conversation uh, i think if i don't hear a response within a week uh, it's okay to drop a message again right spamming them every single day would be would not be advisable but i think a week's time is uh, good enough also relying on the response of one donor because they have accepted uh, your LinkedIn connection or they have responded to your LinkedIn message uh, is something that could be dangerous. Uh, right? Please reach out to as many people as possible. Uh, there is not always a great amount of control that you have on the final decision. There have been plenty of cases where the, the conversations have been had, a formal proposal has been submitted, the proposal has been pitched, uh, perhaps even you will even had an informal verbal consent that uh, you know it's most likely to go through, but for whatever reasons it has uh, it has fallen through the cracks, all right, at the last minute. So things could go down south anytime. Uh, so uh, there is absolutely no harm in approaching multiple donors at the same time. In fact, the more the merrier. Uh, the response time, typically, whether it is a message or an email or uh, this thing, I think. Uh, it's a very subjective call. There is no ground rule here. Uh, depends on the kind of relationship that you share with that person or with that organization. Um, and uh, But uh, as a general guideline, if it is somebody who you absolutely don't know at all, I think uh, revisiting the conversation one week after you have reached out to them is not a bad thing. Anywhere between one week to 10 days. Um, Shiram, one, there's a question from Parminder, but before I come to that, there's a related question. So one, Poonam has asked what will be considered a good conversion rate. And I do have a connected question, Shiram, right? Like what would an ideal pipeline look like? Like if I need to have donors at different stages and hence what would be a good conversion rate? If I need to have three donors on board, uh, then what should I look, like, look at? Right. So... <clears throat> Let me answer this in two different ways, because I think the, the factor that determines this conversion rate, a uh, healthy conversion rate is the quality of talent. All right. So let's look at typical uh, institutional fundraising. I think if we look at it from a typical independence of talent, all right, I think uh, 10, I mean, anywhere between a 50 to 20% right, conversion rate. And when I say conversion rate, if a person is reaching out to 100 donors, Right. Emails are sent to 100 donors. Uh, out of 100, let us say, response rate is probably 35 people respond. The first conversation that you have had conversations with uh, all the 35, at least one, if not more. Uh, eventually, uh, and then you have submitted proposals to, uh, you know, let us say, 20 out of those 35 people. Uh, out of that 20, if you are able to close, uh, perhaps 10. Right? I'm, I'm saying 10 as a number of partners. So 10 as a function of 100. So you've reached out to 100, but you're closing finally 10 people. 10% conversion is actually not bad at all. Uh, however, again, like I said, these, are, these could be very academic conversion rates. The real quality depends on if you're getting across to the right person. Let us say out of the, you don't have to reach out to 100 people. Right? If you're able to reach out to the right people in a corporate or in a foundation, uh, the ones that we earlier spoke about, if the person reached out is the right person, from there, I would argue that if the person is a decision maker, then having a 40 to 50% conversion rate from there is something that has to be the benchmark. 
and for the talent that you have recruited in the organization, if the quality of talent is good. So somebody who comes from an environment where they have interacted with, you know, business leaders, corporate leaders, corporate decision makers, if you give them a pool of people at the right level, uh, then expecting at least a 30% conversion rate, when I say conversion, I mean closure, which means MOU is signed and the funds are in. Expecting a 30% conversion rate from that standpoint uh, is not at all an unfair expectation. If let us say it is a mass code outreach, 100 people, then the earlier example, then anywhere between you know 10 to 15 percent is a very good, uh, very good conversion rate to have from start to finish. Thanks, thanks, Shira. Uh, a question from uh, Parminder. So he says that organization is just two years old uh, and currently uneligible to get CSR funds. But what, in terms of preparation and setup, should be done so that? Uh, they can ensure that the CSR funds flow in once they complete three years. Uh, so preparation, again, it's extremely difficult to find the right person. Again, I know I've probably beaten this down too many, too many times, but uh, if you're one year away from uh, being eligible for CSR fundraising, uh, then getting your basics uh, right in terms of your in basic infrastructure, which is all the documentation, your 12 years and ATGs and three years of uh, financial statements, just about in time so that you're able to start approach them from starting from April 1st. So if your third financial year is ending March 31st of 2023, uh, then making sure that the audit and financial statements are done quickly enough so that you're able to take advantage of the first six months. Uh, right. These are institutional knowledge. The turnaround time on due diligence should be extremely fast. So all your basic documentation, CSR form one, audit financial statements, valleys, ATG, certificate of incorporation, your basic introductory pitch about your organization, about your program, your budgets uh, can all be pre-prepared and kept ready. Uh, so that's what I would mostly focus on. But the most important thing again is uh, please invest in getting the right person uh, as a fundraiser with the organization now that you have, if you don't already have a fundraiser, uh, right? So uh, would be important to invest in getting the right person and uh, a small team that is being able to you know, work on this. Also, Ashiram, Ashiram, can I add on that? Sure, sure, sure. So uh, I was just, uh, you know, inclined on getting what kind of projects do we focus on? I have all documentation in place. Uh, I was looking at, you know, the kind of causes we should focus on in terms of CSR funding. So uh, I don't know what you mean with the permanent. Uh, it means like either. maybe we, we should uh, focus on women empowerment as a main cause or, you know, education as a main cause where CSR fl fund flows in maximum uh, is there any, you know, uh, data for regarding the related to that? So, Parminder, I would like to believe that uh, the kind of work is uh, is decided with non-profit. So, you decide what is the work that you want to do, uh, and you look for uh, either CSR funding or foundation funding for your needs. All right. Uh, for ex but just to answer your question, I think it is common knowledge that. Uh, most of the CSR funding goes to the top three states, uh, unfortunately, being Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. All right. Um, these are the geographies where most of the CSR funding lands. The top areas, obviously, education and healthcare uh, garners most of the funding from CSR. Education, when I say education, uh, education can be broken down into early childhood education. Uh, maybe even skill development sometimes subsumes itself under, under education or higher education, scholarships, etc. Uh, so education, healthcare, skilling, livelihoods uh, are typically areas where most of the CSR uh, thematic areas tend to focus. Environment, it is a focus. Climate change is a huge topic that is garnering a lot of interest among corporates. So uh, if, there is a, if there are organizations that are really focusing on uh, on climate change as a priority or environmental sustainability as a priority that goes beyond planting, uh, you know, uh, sort of tree plantations, all right? Whether it is in waste management, whether it is in plastics, whether it is in tree plant, beyond this, I think I think there are, there are enough opportunities in these areas. 
uh, I think thank you. Uh, it, it helps. I think we we would be starting a waste management soon. I think that could be one of the areas we can be focus. Thank you, Ram. Sure. Uh, thanks, Parvind. Thank In the interest of time, I'm just taking one final question. So uh, again, Sri Ram, uh, one question is on the best strategy to approach H and I donors. Uh, along with that, Nitika also has asked how to reach out to CSR funders. I believe you had touched upon that. But anything you would want to add on um, top of what you already kind of mentioned? Yeah, I think uh, when we say HNIs, let me just break it down to again discovery. Where do you discover the HNIs? Uh, just following websites like uh, you know Crunchbase uh, or TechCrunch, uh, which gives you a lot of information, or YourStory.com, which gives you a lot of information about early stage organizations in India uh, which are doing well and about their founders is a discovery phase. So at least you know who are these people, what are those companies, and what are they focusing on. Uh, so there are enough number of these websites available in India. I mentioned some of the names, but there are a lot more. Uh, right? So discovery of your audience uh, or the names is something that you will get from there. The How do you get across to them is something that is just uh, a lot of creative hacks, uh, right? For example, most of them are, most of them, like I said, are there on LinkedIn. So it's very important for you to craft a message that you want to leave them on LinkedIn. Uh, I would not recommend adding people indiscriminately. People do not like it, uh, right? So always please do some research on, do you know somebody who can introduce you to that person? Uh, that connection could be one degree away, two degrees away, or three degrees away. But uh, somebody in the organization who is focused on researching a little bit about these founders and who in within your network can get, get you across. It might be one among 100. It might be two among 50, uh, right? But that is good enough. Ultimately, you don't have to have 15, 20 people. You just need those five, six people uh, for you to support. So, uh, I mean, depending on your budgets, uh, right? So I think that careful, quick and dirty, uh, smart research that is able to leverage your board's network, your leadership team's network, uh, is something that will get you across to the right people, converting from there. Now, once you get to the right h and assuming that you are speaking to the right person who's connected to your cause, uh, who's known to somebody within your organization, the conversion rates, one is the time taken to convert is very, very quick. If it is taking a long time, that means something has gone wrong in the process. Uh, right. So the conversion rates among h and is are in the 90-95%. Uh, right? If you're able to spend a quality one hour or two hours with them, most people convert and uh, the conversion rate should be higher. Uh, so it is about getting to the right person and leveraging on your network. That is the by far the most important thing as far as h and is is concerned. And LinkedIn is one of the fastest ways to do that. Other things is focus on one, one or two degree connections from them, either in your board or in your leadership team. Corporates, I think we spoke about it. So I'm presuming perhaps the person joined a little late. Uh, so I won't repeat it. Uh, I mean. Sure, Shreera. Um, uh, yeah, we could go to the next topic. Uh, so there was also a question on social enterprises uh, are being able to raise funds. Um, would you want to take that up? So if there are any questions that we have not been able to take up, request all of you to uh, write to Partner Network at Sattva. I'll just put the uh, ID here. Uh, we will kind of get back to you on those questions uh, in the next couple of days. Shriram, I think we can move on to the next uh, topic. because. Uh -huh. I think uh, I think uh, somebody perhaps wanted to ask something. I don't know if it was Dhananjay. I see Dhananjay saying on video. So I don't know, Dhananjay, if you wanted to ask something, maybe I can take that quickly and then and then move on. Yeah, uh, my question was like, uh, you talked about climate change and environmental health and all those stuff. But climate change is a very big topic. I mean, uh, it's very easy to say. So now two things specific. One is carbon dating. Second is restoration of rivers. Uh, so are there, I mean, is the CSR uh, ready to fund on these uh, I mean, uh, initiatives? Yeah, so uh, sort of agree with you. I think when we say, and that argument, Dhananjay, also extends to education, 
right? Education is also a massive universe. Are we talking about building capacities of teachers? Are we talking about building infrastructure of schools? Are we talking about learning assessments being funded? Are we purely talking about technology investments in enabling good, better learning outcomes? So there are so many areas, even within education, healthcare, the usual suspects that, uh, that need far more dissection. Climate change is relatively a very, very new area uh, that uh, has not seen significant investments in the past. The importance of it is being realized and overemphasized, not overemphasized for the right reasons uh, in the recent past. I'm not really an expert on climate change. So as a subset of climate change, I don't know which are those specific areas that uh, receive funding. I do know that in very oversimplistic terms, uh, right? Um, for example, I know that in some cases, afforestation is, is, is equivalent or equal to climate change, uh, right? Or it is perceived like that, uh, right? Just planting more trees and expanding the green cover. But I, I understand that, of, of course, that is not the only thing, right? Or because plastics is a very, very, uh, very trendy topic in the recent past, in the both for-profit and not-for-profit space. So anybody who is able to effectively come up with an alternative for plastics or reduce the consumption of plastics, again, becomes one of those poster boys or poster girls, uh, right? Waste management is another huge area that receives a lot of attention, funding, condensation, etc. Now, on carbon sequestration, what is that proposition? I think uh, if the proposition is very clear, and when I say very clear, clear in a manner that is understood in simple terms by a layman. So, if we had 20 minutes, and if you were to educate me as a complete ignorant person on climate change, let us say, for example, on saying, are you able to articulate to me the, the consequences of this being ignored in a quick, pity manner uh, in 50 minutes? I think that needs a lot of work, right? And that doesn't happen in one conversation. The storytelling or the storyboarding of that requires multiple uh, levels of iterations. The more you are able to talk to people, the more feedback you get and you start to realize that what is what is palatable uh, and what is the language that is spoken about uh, climate change in the community. And then you sort of weave your storyline in line with what is comfortably being heard. That doesn't mean, however, while saying this, I want to be extremely conscious of the fact that it doesn't mean that you start doing work that is being funded and that ends up in a vicious cycle, all right? So the idea is not, the idea is to raise funds for the work that you want to do, not do work for the, for which the funds are available, right? But the ability of uh, the fundraiser to articulate the story in a manner that is accept that is understood by the donor community and is palatable to the donor community is becomes extremely important. And that just comes with a series of conversations and iterations. And uh, where you expose yourself, you tell your story name, you get feedback, you change your pitch. Again, you go back and forth on that loop uh, with multiple people in the in the donor community to inform your pitch. All right. But uh, because there are, this is also a great opportunity because there are not, because it's a new area and there are not a lot, I mean, the climate change ecosystem in the nonprofit sector in India is not something that is uh, very, very competitive and there are not too many organizations. So in my mind, it's also a great opportunity, uh, right? If you, if you have a compelling proposition to take, uh, I think there'll be a lot of donors who will be interested in talking to you, but getting the storyline right would be, would be very, very important. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Great. Uh, Shriram, can we move to the next topic? Yes, we can. Um, sorry, Meenu, do you, would you move the slides? Yes, so the slide is on the donor retention. Are you able yeah. to move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, again, there are multiple uh, organizations depending on where you are in your life cycle here is a here is an important i think the bottom line between foundations corporates and hnis if you look at the if you look at foundations if you look at lifetime value of funds raised from foundations most foundations um, not all of them but most of them have a certain lifespan to their funding it could be three years for example if, let's say if it is drk foundation uh, which invests mostly in early stage not-for-profit organizations across the world they have a very flat fundraising structure of i will give you hundred thousand dollars per year for three years 
now, right? Then there is Bulago, and then there are so many other organizations which take up under entrepreneurs. So most of these foundations have a fixed tenure or a lifespan, which could range anywhere between one year to seven years or more. Uh, right? Average, I would say, is about three to five years. And they have a, certain, uh, a, a lot of value in the kind of funding that they give. Right? So their funding, like I said before, when used for unrestricted purposes, which means organizational capacity building purposes, where you feel the need is the maximum, which is otherwise not supported by CSR, is where I would uh, advise on, on spending foundation money. Okay. Um, but the lifetime value of foundations is not very high. Right? Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not very high because you know that it is going to come with a fixed end line. Right? Corporates through CSR, the lifetime value is disproportionately high. All right. There is, unless or until it's a very extreme case of financial misappropriation, ethical misconduct, or the money being not utilized in an appropriate manner, barring these reasons, there is hardly a, a, a corporate that will discontinue its funding to its nonprofit partner, uh, except for these reasons. All right. Most nonprofits have a seven to 10 year lifetime uh, with a nonprofit with a corporate, if not more. So investing in donor retention, some people call it donor retention, some people call it partner management, doesn't matter, uh, right? But investing in your existing partners uh, to drive more upsells, I think renewal is something that is that is hygiene, right? Uh, when, if a corporate has given you one crore this year, expecting that one crore next year is something that should happen, nevertheless, and that is not a hallmark of a great fundraiser, right? Is the fundraiser able to get 1.5 crores or 1.4 crores more from the same partner is obviously the de facto way to go about it because acquisition is extremely difficult and letting go of an existing partner for reasons that are beyond the extreme is something that is, uh, is simply not acceptable, all right, is what I would say as a fundraiser, all right. So the renewal has to be 90-95% bare minimum, if not more, uh, and raising more money from your existing partners, uh, depending on how many partners you have on the base, I think it's important to calibrate saying that if I have 10 partners, I should be able to upsell at least from two or three partners significantly, if not all the time. Uh, so, and that requires a series of uh, uh, things, uh, starting from how you report. Again, when we say reporting, uh, most corporates have their own fixed formats of reporting, but Ability to churn out these reports because these are very predictable. All of us already know that these are either monthly or quarterly or six monthly reports. Foundations typically focus on reports once in six months or once in a year. Corporates, it can be either monthly or once in a quarter. All right. It's also about expectation setting with the corporate. Uh, sometimes I have seen, you know, social purpose organizations or nonprofits go out of their way to say that I will give you a report every month when there is not even an expectation of a report to be sent every month, uh, right? So negotiating that we will send you a report once in quarter is something that is uh, very, very acceptable, unless or until it's a fixed rule within the corporate that they need monthly reports. Uh, of course, Satwa is also in a very good position to advise uh, you know, non-profits on this because Satwa works a lot with uh, you know, corporates in India. So how do you build in a mechanism that is able to automate these reports, which means the time invested in producing these reports is minimized because this is just a function of data being aggregated in the organization in a manner that it is easy to collect data, easy to store data, and easy to package the data. So these are things that can be done very easily through simple, simple use of tech uh, so that the time invested in churning out these reports is completely minimized. The same happens with financial utilization as well. I think the investment that needs to go in the in the upward swing is in the relationship building. So uh, during acquisition, typically people tend to interact with the CSR teams, but beyond the CSR team, beyond your manager CSR, your head of CSR, or your CSR analyst, uh, beyond these teams, how do you engage with the others in the corporate, particularly in the leadership teams, so that the everybody in the organization knows about you know, their their non all right. Simple tactical things like most corporates will have a newsletter. The newsletter carries a certain section 
about their uh, CSR work in those newsletters? Is your non-profit figuring in those stories or not? Is even a very simple thing so that the recall value of your non-profit with the donor agency and its employees is also very high. There are also corporates where I've seen that the non-profits that they want to work with is voted by the employees. Uh, right? And employees discover non-profits purely based on social media. Uh, right? So the more employees vote for your nonprofit organization, the that is that occupies a very good uh, ratio or weightage in the final decision of the corporates to fund their, you know, fund those nonprofits. Uh, making your presence felt in important sectoral events, uh, right? So either that also it's a great opportunity for your organization to position yourself as thought leaders. For example, Dhananjay, if your organization is working on climate change, and if there is a climate change summit or a conference or a seminar or a webinar that is happening, it's very important for you or somebody from your organization to represent your voice there, uh, which then positions you in a certain way as far as climate change is concerned. So having a radar for these sectoral events that happen throughout the year, there are so many events, so many webinars, so many conferences that happen. Somebody in the organization just uh, crawling information about these events, putting it on calendar diligently and making sure that either somebody is attending or being a speaker in these forums also is super useful. Uh, and somebody also said before, right, whether it is blogs or articles, blogs on LinkedIn, blogs on Medium uh, are always good tools to make sure that the organization's work, the name and the people are coming up in the radar as much as possible. So relationship building beyond the people who you would have worked with while acquiring a, a new donor uh, is by far uh, the most critical non-negotiable step when it comes to renewals and upsells. Um, it also does matter uh, on the response times. So these are very hard metrics in any business development teams. Um, <clears throat> an email that is, uh, we need to, the organization needs to have an SLA uh, within the organization saying that, let's say if there is a request from a donor on some piece of information, what is the response time, uh, right? It really helps to manage performance, track performance, all of these small things contribute to uh, your renewals and upsells. Uh, the response times cannot be, you know, uh, random, right? Depending on the kind of request, it needs to be there with the organization saying that, am I going to take six hours? 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, or maximum 72 hours to respond to this request, all right, depending on the category of those requests. So I think being extremely rigorous, diligent, and intense about uh, working with donors, all of these things lends itself to a lot of professionalism, uh, which is both optical and also real as far as how donors evaluate their nonprofit partners, uh, right? So uh, responsiveness, being professional about it, super rigorous about it really helps. Um, disproportionate amount of focus, for example, on annual reports. Annual report is an important asset of an organization. It needs to be done. I absolutely don't dispute that at all. But uh, I've also seen uh, indiscriminate amount of effort, time that is going into an annual report, which in reality, uh, is not something that uh, decision makers pour over, right? It is a mandatory asset that you need to have on your website. It's more a compliance checkbox, but how many people actually sit and read the annual report is, is something that can be questioned and debated, uh, right? So again, annual reports that are prepared in a manner which are mobile first, mobile friendly, which are quick information that can be consumed instead of long annual reports also help in, uh, in quick digestion of information. Um, please make sure that the partners are able to participate meaningfully uh, in your programs that are either constructed through volunteering engagements or let's say the leadership participating in one of your uh, uh, one of your periodic functions. Let's say, for example, it is uh, it's an education nonprofit. I cannot answer this for all nonprofits, but let us say what we do for an example at the Nanjis. Uh, we, we still do and we, we, we began our journey with skilling and every three months there were a batch of students who were graduating from our programs and being sort of, sort of landing in jobs 
and there used to be a two hour ceremony at the graduation ceremony that we used to organize every two months and we used to invite prospective donors and our existing donors to those ceremonies which actually really was very helpful in building a constant pipeline the moment they come and see a programs live in action there is absolutely nothing that will replace it all right but what becomes important is making sure that you have a active healthy pipeline of people who are already um, you know scheduled for or who's over already calendared for in order to participate in your events and these things require a lot of planning upstream uh, you know to reach out to the right people to block calendars the logistics of it uh, these things require active planning uh, and the importance of it should not be sort of under emphasized uh, uh, at any level uh, would be my uh, sort of thing uh, <clears throat> yeah and uh, basically saying that here is a organizational metric for donor delight uh, right it is evaluated on a score of let us say 10 or 100 these are the six parameters that contribute to you know uh, a high performance fundraising team when it comes to managing partners each of them has certain weightage and actually tracking it diligently and having a score card of sorts for each of your partners uh becomes very useful in strategically and tactically maneuvering these partners so that uh, there is a very high bar on performance within the fundraising team in the organization so that would be uh, my sort of summary uh being able to quantify the performance as much as possible so that you have a scorecard and a mirror to reflect saying that where where are we doing well and where are we doing uh, perhaps not so well uh is something but uh, we started with foundations shorter life spans but extremely strategic because they bring in a lot of credibility through their names and they have a certain pr value uh corporates very high lifetime value uh so investment and retention becomes important hnis again uh, a lifetime value that is very similar to foundations uh but uh, the quantum of the support may not significantly improve you know year on year so if a hni comes on boards and says i will give you 5 lakhs per year for 5 years uh multi year support is something that is relatively easy and straightforward but the absolute amount itself may not increase substantially in case of hnis so lifetime value will be higher but then your quantum of your funding itself may not be very very high uh is what uh, is what i would probably say and retention foundations and hnis have very are for a lack of a better word i'm using this as uh, as low low maintenance comparatively uh corporates uh require high maintenance uh they require much more effort and time and capital uh to invest in partner management foundations and hnis are fairly low maintenance uh you don't have to work extremely hard uh, in order to uh again just in the interest of time minu i'm going to take a pause we have we are at 5:40 uh happy to continue unless and until you feel we should jump into some questions um so shiran there is a question which has come up uh, from sneha which says uh, which is a very which is a good mode of communication to retain donors from abroad uh i'm not sure what uh, sneha if you would probably want to elaborate uh, i would say from abroad emails work really well zoom calls work really well uh your reports work well they, they are not i have seen that uh, donors do not ask you for a lot of information uh, particularly foundations uh, so for example once in a quarter having a zoom call with them or a teams call with them and once in six months typically you you send reports and adding them to the to your outgoing email list are uh, more than enough things that you would you can do for donors from abroad um so would again request participants to share any questions you all have please feel free to again speak up um so maybe we can spend the next 5 minutes uh, to address any questions you have on donor retention or even otherwise uh, if there are questions in the chat box that you feel perhaps may have been missed out uh, please do raise your hand and speak up i'm happy to yeah happy to answer them
Okay, we have one other question from Parminder. Uh, okay, maybe a good time to talk about B two B versus B two C fundraising. Um, my recommendation would be again, uh, again, Parminder, assuming that you're in your early stages, or even for that matter, right? Even fifteen year old organizations, we have everybody across the spectrum. Uh, I think <clears throat> I I still maintain that uh, funding. Availability of funding is not the challenge. The ability to access the funds uh, continues to be a challenge. Uh, right? So having a very dedicated focus on fundraising, whether it is B2B institutional fundraising or B2C fundraising, uh, which is individual fundraising, uh, is extremely important rather than feeling a need to do both. Uh, right? So there is no, there is no uh, compulsion to do both. Uh, right, but it's important on how you look at things. For example, I believe that the future of individual fundraising is not going to be in telemarketing and face-to-face -face fundraising. Uh, most of the individual fundraising in the future as we go forward is going to be, even today, today and the future is going to be online. So the experience of somebody giving online has to be awesome. Uh, in digital, and India is a fairly relatively nascent ecosystem in online giving. Uh, right? So uh, it's not a very evolved and mature ecosystem where you find lakhs and lakhs of people giving online. Uh, I'm talking about lakhs and lakhs of unique people, all right? people who give, continue to give for a long time. But the digital giving market in India is a relatively nascent market. It can only grow from here. Uh, and digital fundraising also requires um, patience for you to start seeing the returns. Uh, right? So crowdfunding is not equal to digital fundraising. Crowdfunding is one form of digital fundraising. And I'm sure all of you are aware of platforms like Give India, Keto, Milab, uh, so who are who are you know impact guru. Uh, these are organizations that are crowdfund that give you crowdfunding platforms. So but what do you raise uh, B2C individual fundraising money for becomes important. Retail fundraising, individual fundraising by definition is more often than not unrestricted. So uh, your, if your organizational budget, let us say is between the three to five crore mark and you have an annual sort of uh, fundraiser or a cost that you want, to, you want to run, let's say your five crores is your budget and 50 lakhs is your, uh, you know, I'm just going by the 10% sort of overheads. Uh, if you want to raise that 50 lakhs completely via online sources through individual donors, it can be done in an annual fundraiser or a biannual fundraiser activity. So where you could use fund, sort of crowdfunding platforms perhaps. But unless or until it serves a very clearly identified strategic need for the organization, doing individual fundraising for the sake of doing it is something that I would not recommend uh, because again, it requires time investment in Somebody needs to sit and create those designs, collaterals, write pages of campaigns. People need to monitor what's happening there. The most important thing that contributes to a success of a crowdfunding campaign is distribution and not content creation, right? So it doesn't matter how beautiful or how compelling your content is on, uh, let's say, you know, uh, Milap or uh, Keto or Givindia. Because ultimately, over a period of time, all content, all stories read and write pretty much the same. Right? What really works is distribution. All right? And somebody within the organization should be actively working on saying, where are these links gone? I've created a donation page. Uh, how, how many people have I sent this message to on WhatsApp? Who's sending the message? How is the message written? So distribution of that message becomes far, far more important than the quality of the content and the design itself. And these things take time. Uh, so your return on ROI, the same amount of ROI, uh, time if you were to invest in a CSR partner, perhaps you will get a uh, 5x, 6x return rather than investing in an individual fundraising platform. So unless until you have a small dedicated team that is working on detailed fundraising throughout the year with the medium to long-term objective of raising individual funds with the organization, uh, I would perhaps, it depends on where your organization is, so it's not a sweeping declaration, uh, but very doing it because funding is available there is not something that I would, uh, I would recommend on, uh, on individual fundraising.
right? But putting a simple donate button and having a payment gateway on your website, tracking the users on your website, where are they landing, how many are clicking on donate buttons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is a basic hygiene that I would I would definitely recommend. Um, so, Sriram, there's a question about payroll giving fund, um, uh, raising that through corporates. Yeah, uh, again, I would, in these things, I think somebody earlier asked, asked a question of uh, engaging with, uh, you know, third party consultants or organizations. I think uh, this is a great example of, uh, you know, working with somebody else who's already doing this as their, as their life's work, right? So uh, let's say, for example, organization, uh, if you go to a Mila or a Keto or Givindia, uh, for example, I, since, since I'm associated with Givindia, I know that uh, you know, everything is managed by Givindia, uh, right? So all you have to do is register your organization uh, and payroll giving B to B to C. So they work with a lot of corporates, employees from those corporates give via the corporate through their monthly uh, you know, salaries. And that is distributed among various nonprofits, uh, depending on uh, how they manage it. So I think getting yourself registered on Give India and platforms like Give India is a very simple, straightforward thing to do. Rather than, uh, I would rather avail their services rather than trying to set it up on their own, on our own. Um, Vikas has a question on: um, Does fundraising dinners work? Uh, well, yes, it works. Uh, there's no doubt it doesn't work. But again, because uh, it depends on your need. For example, um, I'm sure all of you have heard of galas, dinners that typically happen in the US, uh, right? Uh, so a fundraising dinner, for example, what we hear is, you know, Teach for India did this dinner and they raised a billion dollars from Sundar Pichai, right? Or Pratham did this dinner and they raised... Uh, e in, you know, two million dollars in one night, uh, right? So it's important to it's important to understand that there is a cost that goes into organizing these galas and dinners as well, uh, right? Uh, I've never done galas and dinners myself, so I do not have the exact statistics. But from a very uh, ballpark estimate, and please take this with a pinch of salt, I feel there is a twenty five to 30% cost of fundraising. So in order to raise a million dollars, I need to spend $300,000, all right? So are you in a position to make that kind of investment? Or is something that's a question that you have to ask, all right? Are you also in a position to, are you, do you have bandwidth in your organization to actually make these things happen? Because if you are investing in this, it really needs to be planned really well because galas and dinners don't happen every month or every fortnight. They happen once in a year or twice in a year. I know, for example, uh, you know, uh, from some of my colleagues who've done that, uh, it, the team uh, in UK, uh, Pratham, for example, works for an entire year to organize fundraising galas and dinners and auctions that happens twice in a year. So it's a year-long effort that goes in through fully paid staff in order to do, to do galas and dinners, right? Are you... Do you have that kind of time, bandwidth, and people dedicated to do this? If yes, perhaps yes. Uh, otherwise, I perhaps would not recommend starting something because the return on investment in institutional fundraising is far more higher when you compare to the time uh, that is contributed as an input. Uh, so I would leave it at that because it comes at a certain cost and effort and also reach. Uh, Prathams and Teach for India are able to do these annual fundraising dinners and galas because the board is actively involved in outreach. They bring the people to these galas and dinners uh, and that, therefore they become successful. So if you have a presence, if you have somebody in the US or in India who's able to do this actively for you, then yes. So it is the ROI that you have to look at. How much are you spending in order to make this happen? And how much are you able to raise from there? So Unless or until there is a deep presence in, in the US or in Europe, uh, my advice would be to not pick it up uh, and rather focus more on uh, institutional fundraising. Um, next two questions. So one, Sriram, uh, I think there's a question from Dhananjay which says, donor accepts some parts of the proposal and activities, 
um uh, dhananjay maybe you want to speak up because i'm not uh, very yeah. interested yeah 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 i mean uh, when we write a proposal there are set of uh, i mean things written in the proposal there are a lot of activities also over there I mean, not a lot of i mean according to the need of the project there are activities but finally some activities are approved but at the end of the day when you are i'm um, submitting the final project report there are a lot of things which comes up over there which was written in the proposal but that was not approved by the donor this is one i mean in donor retention relationship this becomes a i mean a hiccup for both of us because they are asking something which is not i mean there which was not approved <clears throat> so uh, so dharanjay this is again not very it's i don't think it is specific to a not for profit organization versus a donor uh, even on regular business to business right even in the for profit everywhere it happens so let me let me put this into two types one is an agreement slash an mou uh, can be treated as an agreement in spirit and, and an agreement in action uh, right an agreement in action would focus on oh, what is the clause clause 7.1 subsection a did not call this out so why are you asking me for this right that's being extremely extremely focused on the nitty gritties of what the mou or the contract or the obligation is saying all right now there are certain kinds of organizations because of who they are and where they come from and what their legacy systems are they stick to the words that are mentioned on paper right and they strictly honor that code uh, right hey this is what the paperwork says and uh, this is what we we are expecting and that is very straightforward but there are also there is also the in spirit expectations uh, right not everything is likely to be captured in the mou or will be captured in the mou and that's where your ability to set expectations manage expectations in a in an institutional fundraise uh, the energy most things work because of people relationships all right it doesn't necessarily happen because of something being said in the paper or not being said in the paper uh, it's it's a it's a largely a function of the kind of relationship that you share with people in that organization who also change right it's not that the same person will continue to be there in the organization for a long period of time so those um, those important commitments are, should be captured on paper for example what happens to the interest that is generated from the income that a donor is giving you all uh, right so let's say donors uh, you've signed a 2 crore partnership for one year uh, and the donor has decided to transfer those 2 crores on 1st of april the 2 crores will generate some interest the interest income should be used for the purposes of the of the same program or can it be used as for the purpose of any program that the organization does or can that interest go into let's say a corpus today it is not possible i mean one year back this question was still possible all right csr funding going into corpus but these things because it should not be person dependent decision these important things as an example i said this should be captured on paper but let us say hey i told you that i will send you a report on a quarterly basis but you are asking me reports every month is something that sometimes maybe there is a board meeting maybe there is somebody who's coming so then turnaround times that are expected may not always fall in line with what is said on paper but these are expectations that you set manage recalibrate on an ongoing basis and what is it a function of it's a function of the relationship that you build with people in those organizations uh, sometimes it is an fortunate or an unfortunate reality in both cases all right there are there are cases where the recipient of the funds have set a lot of expectations and struggle to manage them sometimes it is other way around also where the paperwork does not reflect all the expectations but there is there is uh, more expectations than like, like in your case right what you just said uh, but but i feel in the institutional world these push and pull you will find some donors who are fairly easy to manage some of them a little difficult to manage but i think uh, these are these are nuances that we have to live with not to be i feel in the not for profit world but in any any world uh, uh dhananjay um if you have a follow yeah. up we can quickly yeah yeah i mean that. like uh, sriram said that the money comes to but these are all goes into the current account so there is no question of interest coming in that is one thing because uh, the money comes in 
but those are not saving accounts. First thing. Second thing about the donors. I mean, the person who is approving the proposal is a different person, and the person who is asking for the donor reports is a different person. So he looks at the proposal. He doesn't look what has been approved, and he goes by those activities, whatever is written in the proposal. So this gap, I mean, uh, I mean between uh, in the team of the donors, and these are new um, donors who have pitched in during this COVID times. I won't mention their names, and they're very new to this. I mean, they want. I mean, as you said, that, that these donors are. I mean, due to this uh, pandemic. The, the fund flow has taken a back seat because the activities were stopped, halted for the last two years. All of a sudden, as you said, last October, it started flowing. And everybody, all the donors want to spend it. Even the big one foundations want to spend their money. So they're just pushing the money to the I mean, uh, implementing agencies or the NGOs or the trust or whatever. Um, sorry, um, Mr. Dhananjay, if I could interrupt you, right? Sorry, because we just have hardly four minutes on the clock. Uh, and happy to kind of, uh, because this is a very specific scenario, uh, happy to take this up uh, separately as well. Uh, because there are two other pointers we wanted to quickly catch up on. So if you don't mind, uh, we would kind of quickly like to cover those. And we can connect separately on this if required. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dhananjay. Um, Vikas had, uh, uh, I don't know if Vikas, you have a point. Uh, um, so maybe if you have a point. Uh, we know maybe we can take it up separately. My question was around uh, social impact bonds, uh, sure, sure. but maybe that's a topic we can take it separately. Sure. So uh, Sriram, if you have any thoughts on um, social impact bonds and any other trends in fundraising that the NGOs should look out for, that would be great to hear. Uh, one another question, because a lot of people asked about this, right, which is uh, about uh, building a culture of uh, developing a relationship with uh, uh, donors, right? How do you do that in the organization? And how do you move from a transactional relationship with funder to really building a, a good rapport and an in-depth relationship? <coughs> So let me just quickly maybe, you know, answer the, uh, or not answer, I, it's, a, it's a huge topic, but uh, on the social impact bonds or by extension, any blended finance instrument. Uh, again, uh, I feel, why is an organization, why does an organization want to do a social impact bond is an important question to answer first uh, before getting into, okay, because there is an SIB or a DIB available, let's try and explore about it. Because the reality is that there are there is one organization, Educate Girls, that has actually successfully done a DIB in India, along with MSDF, Tata Trust, and uh, and UBS. Uh, and recently, there was NSDC with British Asian Trust and others who have floated a DIB. There are not many real life examples of DIBs and SIBs that have actually fructified. Uh, right. It's a very early ecosystem. There are a lot of conversations. Um, there's a lot of education and learning curve for many organizations to even understand what these things entail. The cost of transactions associated with them are also quite high, right? Uh, in the servicing cost, because since you are since you asked the question, I'm assuming that you're reasonably familiar. So the cost associated with this are also very, very high. So without, without answering the question, why is it that we need to do a DIP, right? Um, is it, uh, is it, for example, in Educate Girls, I would strongly encourage, I'm not sure if that video is something that can be found in the public domain, but would strongly recommend uh, uh, listening to Safina Hussain explain, she's the CEO of Educate Girls, explain why did she even get into DIPs in the first place and what was the reason? So I'm happy to maybe take this offline or in some other conversation because, but I think knowing clearly why should that operation get into DIPs or SIPs, before getting into one is a very important question to answer uh, without, before spending a lot of time on it uh, because it's not something that is uh, within the capacity or capability for everybody to do, do it. And it's also a very, very early stage ecosystem. Uh, happy to take this offline and probably discuss more. The transactional to uh, the uh, sort of quality building relationship uh, and Nandita, thanks for asking that question. 
like i said i think it's more of an art which can be made scientific over a period of time but the moment it is made scientific it loses the it it loses the very nuance and pulse of how that is being done in the first place right most b to b relationships are very uh, uh, personalized customized uh, first it starts with the mindset to make it non non a non transaction uh, right so uh, <clears throat> uh, if the if, if the mindset is to say that hey there is there is a giver there is a receiver and there is a contract that binds both of us and i'm going to stick within those boundaries uh, the moment that is the mindset with which uh, we get into i think uh, i think that is not going to be that is not going to work in favor of us translating that all right from from a transactional to a to a, to a mature relationship uh and one of the, some of the ways to do it tactical things and this is not something that you can plant to everybody uh it really has to be a function of the person so i feel the most important skill set that one needs to look for in order to do well in the fundraising team again it's a question of talent is is b to b fundraising is definitely more about eq than about iq all right so a person who has handled c level i mean c suit level relationships people who come with a demonstrated muscle and experience because these are not things that are built overnight these are muscles and skills that are acquired over a period of time uh, so investing in senior people who have an experience of having worked with spoken to interacted with uh, you know c level executives or senior leaders in the corporate uh becomes extremely important because there is only so much that you can teach and uh, other things are learned just by doing it uh, right uh then smaller things like uh problem solving so relationships get built for example let's look at normal uh normal human relationships right uh when two people get to know each other you help out each other and solve a problem that the other person is having and therefore a certain likability towards a person improves and respect towards a person also improves all right i consciously use these two words likability is the first important thing but the likability translating into respect is what builds real relationships and the respect uh, gets built because of the knowledge of the sector knowledge of the problem statement that your organization is focusing on more also importantly is how are you able to solve the other person's problem uh which could be anything all uh, right for example let's say an organization that is uh, perhaps evaluating investments in the area of disability and inclusion right they want to speak to some other corporate or a foundation who has been probably investing in disability or inclusion for a for 3 4 years now the first first thing is for you to be aware of this right and awareness of these comes in only when you have conversations that are outside the ambit of the transaction all right so if conversations move beyond what they have funded you for and what are you uh, you know doing about this program then even a simple problem of saying that hey you wanted to speak to organization x i know somebody there let me connect you to them and i will make that conversation happen and actually going forward and doing it uh, also is a simple help that you are able to offer all right so uh, there are for example uh, organizations where you know uh, there might be a, the, and these are real examples that i'm talking about not a figment of my imagination there are certain there might be certain cases in certain organizations where the capacity or the capability of the person within that organization to tell your story uh in their format let us say you have sent it to them in the form of a powerpoint presentation but the final proposal is being converted into a form of a word document but the person is not able to crystallize your proposal and articulate it effectively in their format first of all knowing that the formats are different is important and that happens only in informal conversations right knowing that is important and then saying that offering help to say hey can i can i offer you help in that area because you know the program inside out you being able to do that yourself and making that person's life better or easier is also a simple tactical problem solving hack so there are problem statements that exist at your end and at their end being aware of each other's problems and being able to add value to solve their problems uh, in their world uh, is one of those uh, i would say strong 
strong mechanics to move the patient shift from being a transactional one to uh, to a more um, a partnering relationship and not just somebody who has given you money and you've taken the money. Kan Kan Shi Agarwal. I'm sorry if I'm yes. mispronouncing yes. your name. But no, hi. Thank you, Shreeram. Um, so yes, we are one of the nudge incubators this year. I'm um, Kan Shi Descent. My question is very specific to a recent conversation, which starts with the fact that when do we bring money really in early stage, say, you know, funder conversations? And second, when the funder has like heard you for say 45 good minutes and they say at the end of it, that we reopen this conversation, say a couple of months down the line, right? Now, how, like, what are the different, I'm sure, sure somebody might have asked these questions, but. What are the different ways of engaging when you see that a potential funders wants to look at your work, especially in the digital times that we live in, uh, calling everybody for a Zoom, say, you know, Zoom interaction may not be possible. So how do you create spaces where they can interact and experience the work really? Um, that is the specific. So there are two questions to it. One, when do you bring the money conversation really? because uh, people are like, okay, we are here to explore the conversation. And second, how do you engage with them? Yeah, so, uh, so Kamshi, I think again, the on digital base, how do you engage? Once I know your program, then I may be able to be much more, be able to be much more specific. Uh, yeah. Like for example, uh, when I talked about our skilling graduation ceremonies, which used to be in person, right, every three months, today everything is happening online. So the graduation ceremony itself is now conducted online. So we invite uh, leaders from the corporates or people from the corporates online to join us on a simple Zoom, uh, right? Uh, for example, let us say the Nudge Incubator, uh, right, which you're part of. Earlier, pre-COVID, it used to, so the graduation ceremony or the Sawyer 8, as we call it, used to happen physically in an auditorium or in a hall where we used to assemble philanthropists then the incubators, they make a 40 second pitch and then the actual dating exercise happens in person. Today, the soiree is happening over Zoom, all right? Or platforms like AirMeet, for example. So, but there might be certain programs which may not be, which perhaps is not possible to project or impose on the digital uh, you know, arena. Now, can the programs really not happen digitally? Or have you figured out, have you not figured out a way to do it digitally is a question that I cannot answer in this forum. It will be very unfair for me to comment on. Let's say, for example, a mental health organization, right? Uh, I, I don't know the different kinds of models and interventions that uh, organization with this focus on mental health might be involved in. I know of a few, but I wouldn't claim to know everything. Now, how do you, how do you provide that experience to a donor online via Zoom or uh, Teams is something that might be difficult, but then there are other other things that you could do. Not everything has to happen via Zoom and Teams and Airme. When I say when I say engagement, I don't think it is always through by means of a participation in an event. Right? Events are a great way to engage, participate, throw spotlight, you know, give them some love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But. Uh, there are other ways also to do it. Keeping them informed is the first step. And again, uh, Kanshi, as much as I might uh, want to sound very strategic about it, uh, right? I can tell you experientially through my own experience and through the lived experience of many, 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 many organizations that the devil is always lost in the details and not in ideas. Ideas are dime a dozen, right? And ideas are always those five, six, seven, ten ideas. But it is execution where... Some people do a really thorough job and there are some leakages that happen, uh, right? Just the diligence, right? To do it consistently, repeatedly, even though you may not meet with success, right? Yeah. Uh, that requires certain resilience, relentlessness and shamelessness, uh, right? For example, simple things like, oh, I sent an email, but I don't get a response. Yeah. But is WhatsApp happening? I can tell you that out of, let's say the nudge events that happen, most or not most, almost 90, 95 percent of the RSVPs that happen to an event does not happen on email responses. I am, I am, I don't know whether Satwa wants to add the, the, because they also do a lot of these things. Like most of these RSVPs happen on 
on WhatsApp confirmations. Yeah. And yeah. these confirmations happen when I ping people, uh, right? The team might have also pinged, but I have to do that, right? When do I do this? I do it on a Saturday, Sunday. I don't do it on Monday to Fridays, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on what is the time that you ping. For example, people think that, I know I, I won't go on and on, but people feel that, oh, should I ping somebody early in the morning? Is it, is, is it interesting? I can tell you that most senior leaders respond to emails and WhatsApps early in the morning between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Uh, right? How do I know this is not because I read it in some management textbook, right? It is because I've tried, I've tried and I have failed, but in many cases I've succeeded. I have also been shouted at by people. Mm -hmm. But without being shouted at, how will I ever learn? Right? How will I ever know? All right? So I think these things have to be tried and tested as bizarre or as absurd as it may sound to somebody else. You do it for yourself, you figure it out for yourself. And just diligent execution matters in most of these cases. Uh, right? It is not necessarily about the idea itself. Makes uh, sense. But, but yeah, based I'm on your based on your work, I'm ha again happy to, since you're anyway within our ecosystem, I'm happy yeah. to connect with you separately as well. Yes, I'm supposed to be writing to you anyways. I'll uh, you know take the conversation, but there, but it was really, really helpful. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Shriram. I think we'll have to wrap up now because there is also another call scheduled on this line in the next 15 minutes. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for participating. And if you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to write to us at partnernetwork at satwa.co.n. I can also share the ID uh, over email or on this link. Uh, but Shriram, a great session. I think uh, the best thing was it comes from somebody who has done this. Uh, and uh, talking from experience, right? So uh, super interesting. Uh, what we'll also do is uh, share the uh, recording and we'll try and consolidate this, uh, all the points discussed plus the questions in a curated manner and share with all the participants. We'll also share a consolidation of resources. I know a lot of interesting resources were shared on the chat. We have tried to capture it. Um, so we shall share that with the participants. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Sriram. Uh, we hope to see you all in the next session. Uh, we'll be uh, sharing the details of that uh, soon. Um, so uh, looking forward to that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Vino. Thanks, Ashwini. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity. And thank you so much for patiently